Namaste and good evening, everyone. Namaste, Narad. Namaste. We are happy to have you with us. Namaste, Shadalu. Namaste and welcome to everyone. Namaste. We are happy to continue today uh, on the same topic, dreams, visions and out-of-body experiences. And we will be taking some questions that we received from our viewers. And on the same theme or different questions, you may address at our email ID, integralstudies.in at gmail.com or during the conversation in our chat box on YouTube. So we will take first two quick questions. This Vanant, I discovered your talks a few months ago and have been following them since. There is a difficulty. You talk of posting links. Where are they posted? Could you yes. please let me know? I am a subscriber of your YouTube channel. <laughs> yes. Under every video, you will find a little uh, link which says description. Normally, there is a description of the video itself in there. And earlier, I used to have just the title. And whenever there is a reference to links, the links have been added there. If you're watching from your mobile phone, then on your mobile phone, you might click on description. It will show you the first two lines and then there'll be a dot, dot, dot and a more. You need to click more to open that fully. So you might have to click twice to be able to view this. But just explore under the video itself, the little line that says description. If you're on a desktop computer, it's more easy to recognize. Even then description is normally narrow. You might have to click a little button that says more to widen it. But it is attached to the video itself just under. We can go to the next question. Adria, you mentioned that MP3 blocks the frequency that allows you to go out of the body. On the HemiSync website, there are only two options, MP3 and FLAC formats. Is FLAC better? Yes, FLAC is supposed to be a superior compression format in which certain fine variations are not lost. But uh, at the end of the day, whenever there is a compression, there is a certain loss of the range which is outside, either lower or higher frequencies, and these are reduced. So if it is coming from the official website, possibly they have done something to um, ensure that is not lost. It's not so much about frequency here. It is rather, from what I understand with the hemi-sync, is that there is a slight difference in the phase between the sound coming on the ear, left or right. There are other methods, sometimes then it is a frequency, a lower frequency and a higher. The difference being about 10 hertz or 12 hertz, depending on what they want to create in the brain state. But it's not that this makes you go out of the body. As I mentioned last time, in itself, that is not enough. At best, these things are useful to bring you to a state of deep restfulness, relaxation, uh, or a degree of interiorization. I would suggest for all of you who are watching this, that if you have a practice of deep concentration or meditation, you should be able to enter those states directly by conscious effort of concentration and relaxation. And with that, you can go much deeper than any such indirect tools can take you to. It's just that it may take you time to go to a much deeper state. Or you may pause at a stage where you feel familiar and you don't make the effort to go deeper still. So I'll make two indications generally for those of you who want to practice this consciously. And I mean not just for entering into deeper states, for having, let's say, an opening to other experiences or out-of-body experiences, but also generally for meditation for a spiritual purpose. One of the commonest mistakes people make is to go into a certain state that is familiar. And because now it is familiar, you stop and say, ah, yes, I'm there, this is what it is. So let's say you go within, you feel a certain presence, you feel, a, you feel the contact with the mother's consciousness or the influence of your psychic. And you say, ah, yes, this is the familiar space, this is where I feel good, and you stop there or you go above the head, feel the presence above, feel a peace or a wideness or whatever the nature of the experience, 
and you say, ah, yes, I am there and you stop. Or there is an altered state where you go into something which is indescribable, you don't know what you are at, but now you are familiar and you stop. The mistake is to stop. The correct thing would be being in that state, you rest in it and then very slowly, very gently, you as if go deeper. And the movement to go deeper is done with an intention as if you drift back or lean back or you aspire to be carried deeper, inward, upward, wider or in deeper immersion, in self-loss, in identity, in whatever the nature of the experience it is. But always the intention should be first to allow time to get to what is familiar and then to go deeper and then again deeper, whenever you can, gently, a little more. And the same principle would be applicable even when you do things which relate to uh, an effort with the surface consciousness. Let's say you are walking on the road and you are concentrating, let's say on the presence within you, around you or remembering the mother feeling her presence or opening to some deeper perception behind the appearances, whatever the form it may be in the practice. You say, ah yes, I am there. Good. Stabilize the experience and then as if push to deepen further. You should never stop with the experience itself. Of course, if the experience is already deepening on its own or taking its own direction and form, do not interfere. Let it carry you. And if the experience is still fresh, rich, new, let it immerse, let it stabilize, let it grow familiar. What I am referring to is what you do when you come back to an experience that is already familiar. Then you don't stop with the familiarity, you must push a little more, a little more each time. So, when it comes to this entering the state, I am coming back to the question which is about the hemisync. I personally don't think you need that. If it gives you the satisfaction of some support, go ahead. But when you concentrate to go deeper, to go into a state of deep immersion, relaxation, it's a kind of meditation, you may say, for the purpose of becoming, let's say, sufficiently relaxed to have an out-of-body experience, if that be your intention. Still, directly go as deep as you can, rest in it and then deepen a little more, and then a little more, and then a little more. And you will very quickly reach a depth far deeper or a relaxation even far deeper than anything that these tools can give you. Rather, you may reach a point where the sound of these tools would tend to pull you out. At that point, I will say you have outlived any usefulness such tools may provide. And it's better to let it go. The only utility for such a tool may be because it's blocking your ear from other noises which might be distracting, perhaps. Then you use white noise or pink noise, one of these variations, which might be also helpful. But this is my suggestion. I would say simply experiment. Whatever works better for you, that's what you follow. Always the evidence is in the experience. We can go to the next question. Uh, your your audio is muted. Yes. <laughs> Nishikant, I follow the mother's tips on remembering dreams and being much more conscious during sleep. I follow these steps and sometimes I could remember a series of dreams. I wonder how these dreams appear. Please elaborate. <laughs> okay. There's actually a whole talk of the mother on this topic. There are several talks she has given. And I would maybe just read from a fragment of one which is unusual only because it's a fragment, if I can find that here now. So there's a talk where she speaks of how uh, most dreams are really a mix of things which come from the subconscious. So that's not very useful in itself. But there are dreams which represent a part of the consciousness which has actually gone out into other gradations, into other worlds. And in that partial exteriorization, you might have experiences, the kind of which you are so different from the physical world and the physical experience that you might actually 
find them difficult to recall when you wake up simply because it is so different and so this is one of the things where a conscious effort would make a huge difference because when you enter the same states consciously the return with conscious awareness allows you to build a certain capacity of continuity and then particularly the nature of that experience being so different when you come back it should not get reduced totally if you are retaining continuity you will notice how it gets reduced and then you could make an effort to hold an intermediate state of experience familiarize yourself with those states and then when you, then when you slowly come back to the surface parts then at that point uh, you are actually bringing a quality of consciousness or experience which is well beyond anything possible to the let's say physical mind and the surface awareness and so that becomes useful it's worth making this effort uh, my point is just recalling a dream to the surface is a good start but also use that occasion now to get to somewhere in between where already you have the you can feel the quality of consciousness of the dream state fizzling out this is i said the second kind of dream where you a part of you exteriorizes etc there's a third kind of dream which actually is a reflection of things happening on other levels now one of the things which we are not normally conscious of is that at night during sleep your body is sleeping some part of you may be dreaming but that's not the full story the reality is that on every grade of consciousness in every body there is some registration happening constantly each of these could be recalled as a dream or could be recovered as a memory and so when you return to the physical body consciousness normally you come back with one dream memory one thread which is probably the layer closest to your waking state but in fact there are other layers where also dreams were taking place i've shared this experience before but i think i'm going to i intend to make this series a little bit longer with a lot of uh, samples from text from the mother and sri aurobindo as well as exercises that all of us uh, all of us could use to develop some of these capacities if it interests you or at least to understand better so i'll i'll repeat certain things so that this series on the on the theme can become more complete and you will pardon me if uh, it is a repetition i rec- remember once when i was doing this practice of recalling dream i was in a certain dream and there was a physical distress physical discomfort which pulled the consciousness back to the body to waking state and at the moment as i came back i was able to recall three dreams so one of the things that happens when you start developing the memory of dreams is you remember just the last dream first then after a while as you recover that last dream more completely you feel and remember the tail end of the previous dream and then you can as if reach out into the second or the previous to last and then sometimes that opens you to the tail end of the previous one so i thought at first on waking that there were three dreams and i was recalling the last three so i took time to remember the third of the dreams which was the most vivid the other two were less vivid so they seemed like they were before and i remembered this ending at a time when it was some odd thing i was as if on a plane with an open cover and it was just taking off and i had the wind coming on me and the kind like as if you're in a bus except it's a plane <laughs> and then there's this physical distress which is pulling the consciousness and i start waking up so i take time recall this while i'm holding the thread of the next two i go to the next dream and i don't remember now what it was exactly but it was something as if i was in a hall i was moving from one room into another there was a big opening about to enter another hall another room from the big opening and at that point i felt the physical discomfort and the waking started and then i recall the third dream similarly now i don't remember what it was and again it was interrupted by the physical discomfort and the waking started now what was amazing was there were three different dreams they seemed to be as if the nearest and then one before and the one before that but all three were simultaneously ending with the same 
interruption of the physical discomfort. And then it struck me, there were actually three different levels, gradations of consciousness, in which the dreams were taking place simultaneously. Fascinating. And if not for that physical pull and the remembrance of the three endings, I would never have figured this out because the moment you come back into the physical mind, brain-based mind or the mind embedded in the brain, it immediately rearranges the content of the dreams to match its expectation or its familiarity. It dulls the memory, of course, it reduces the quality and the intensity of the experiences, but it also arranges into linearity of time. Because our mind is only capable of one focus, one thing, one thought, one superficial awareness at a time. In fact, we have different layers behind which are active, but we, we are not conscious of. But this layer on the surface into which we are returning knows only to do one thing at a time. So if it remembers three things, it sequences them. And so the nature of the distortion is quite uh, dramatic when we come back to the surface. As with it, also a loss. I give another example. This was a dream which I had in a young stage, in teenage, when I remember being in a space which was familiar to the child's uh, memory somewhere in the school. And then there was this person which was from a comic book character. I can just say it, it's, it might be funny, but uh, the, you know, there's the phantom comic. So the phantom comic character is in front. And then I notice the vividness of the violet mauve color of the clothing, which in the comic is violet mauve. But here it is much more intense, extremely vivid, rich color. And then I wake up and as I'm waking up, there was continuity of consciousness and I could feel the colors reducing, dimming, darkening until at the moment of waking up, it became as if black and white. Interesting. But in the waking state, there was no corresponding equivalent of that color. In the dream, there was a distinct color to which the closest, maybe the violet move, because that's what the comic was about, but still the color seen there and the thing here, there was no corresponding color here. The result being that in the return, what was remembered was a almost gray tint. Except that the memory was still fresh, I could say, no, it was that color. And I could even, in the finer grade of the mind, recall what it's like. And what is interesting, this is quite fascinating, I think it would have happened around the age between 10 and 12. It's interesting that even today I remember this as an experience. I might have referred to it three or four times in various talks. But what was special about this, why the memory would remain, is because of this sense of the continuity from a deeper range to the surface, wherever there's a continuity built, one of the characteristics of the deeper range is what we call subliminal in Sri Aurobindo's vocabulary, is that it never forgets. All forgetting memory is on the surface layer, the memory that is forgotten. If you could go back into the, what is called the subliminal range in the inner mind or inner vital, etc. If this barrier between the surface and the inner could be thinned or even dissolved completely, you will find in those layers all memory intact. Fascinating. Now I'm going to take the occasion to connect it because we are also talking about out-of-body experiences. I'm going to connect it to uh, certain things which you have referred to this book of Mark O'Byrne and I will keep drawing upon certain examples from him as well as uh, because they are fascinating and I personally find them to be of a very deep grade of authenticity. So in the, at the end of this book, the question is asked, what is it that made him exceptional to be able to have these experiences? And his uh, French publisher asked him this question. So I read now from the book, Mark writes, we often talk together. Christel, that is his publisher, is always eager for more details and additional data. We came to the following conclusion. What characterizes me mainly is memory. I remember my entire life. At 14, at the end of middle school, we were all seen by a psychologist to determine our orientations. 
it is with this lady that I learnt that it is not common to remember early childhood, which I told her in detail at her request. Breastfeeding from my mother, switching to bottle feeding, learning to walk and everything that follows. There are no blind spots, no breaks. I was four years old when, during a walk in the snowy countryside, I began to painfully relive the psychological symptoms of my previous incarnation. The one I spent a few months in, alone in the dark, dusty, dusty dormitory of a western orphanage. I was sick, lying in a small bed among other unfortunate companions, abandoned by, by my parents too. I died quickly. It was in the beginning of the 20th century. Abandonment, one of the suffering that most easily transition from one incarnation to another, even more than hatred. I remember many past lives, often with a lot of details. I remember every morning my dreams and sometimes out-of-body voyages. I remember things that happened between two incarnations in higher worlds. In this life, I remember, for example, the moment my parents went to see the parish priest to prepare my baptism. I was in my father's arms, head up, and I had trouble following with my eyes the strange black thing that was moving around the room, the priest. The memory of my first day at kindergarten is very, very vivid. What I saw, what I did, what I thought, everything is intact. I think that with a little effort, I could almost remember every day spent at that school. Now here's an interesting observation. While he's saying everything is there, available, nothing is lost, if you want to distinguish from one day to the next, to the third, to the fourth, it would still require for the mind to focus as if to sift out and separate out and then go into the memory and recall it. Now, why am I spending time on this? Because you will understand as we go along. In the subliminal mind, all this is held intact. Our surface memory is actually drawing from that memory. I've often in other talks, particularly to do with uh, um, certain kinds of experiences which we have discussed before, uh, in many of these talks I've often said, uh, I think a lot of uh, talks relating to education, in many of these I have said that uh, surface memory and then the memory at the back, I think in the discussions in the synthesis of yoga also, I've given this example. If I ask you to remember what was the first time that you remember of being on a beach or on the top of a mountain or within deep inside a forest, whatever it is, something unusual? Can you remember that? Well, observe what happens in you. Your mind turns as if into the past to draw out the memory. And at that moment, simultaneously, there's a rush of memories coming forward of which your mind automatically moves to the earliest. It's as simple as that. Now, if you have to do this with a computer, a computer searching a hard disk, find me the photo of my earliest trip to whatever mountain. Now, this computer has to go through all the photographs and you may optimize the algorithm to make that faster, but nevertheless, it will still have to sift through all the photographs, first accumulate all the photos which have to do with that mountain trip or any mountain trip, and then that mountain trip, and then sift out of it by date which was before, which was after. You, your mind does not need to do that. In fact, if you had to take the analogy of the physical brain and unfortunately this is the mistake scientists make to think that the brain is or the mind is the same as the brain which is the same as uh, computers. No, computers are much more mechanical. Maybe the brain is closer to that. But even the brain is able to retain much more richly. And so neural networks as a representation come closer to the brain's working where you can have associated memories overlapping in the same space. But still, you have to sift through all of them. Whereas in the inner mind, as you turned to remember, the memories came forward. Who sifted and drew out all those memories? And this is the point we have to really understand to appreciate the nature of the inner mind and your true mind, which is, it is in fact your true mind. As you turned to remember, 
you didn't remember you only turned with the intention the one who remembers already had all the knowledge all the memories simultaneously and put forward the relevant memories so when the memories came forward the inner mind actually recognizing your need pushed forward in response those memories and of course it was obvious to you which was the earlier memory but at the same time perhaps two or three memories came forward or perhaps the earliest memory came simultaneously forward associated with other related memories but that whole sifting and there's no sifting here it is simultaneously present it's a parallel movement and it just puts what you needed except when there is a gap what's the common thing that happens i want to remember the memory starts coming and then there's a block it's on the tip of my tongue i just got it and the moment i turned it faded out and i turn back and again when i remember it came and then it faded out we have all had these experiences this is a blockage in the physical layers like a thin curtain like a veil or some part where a linkage is broken so often when we have not slept enough there is a loss of the physical brain cells and with that a loss of the memory or the blurring or mixing of certain memories but that's at the brain cell level you shift your consciousness into the inner mind and you'll find everything intact bring it to the surface and you might find oh there's a barrier here to find the right word to translate and so on so we have to understand what really happens when uh, we recall from an inner layer and the memory comes forward but let me just complete this which i was reading because it's it's so important so he's speaking of the kindergarten days and i think that with a little effort i could almost remember every day spent at that school i sometimes return home with a friend didier he is the son of the baker located 150 meters from the school i still have 250 meters to go to reach home crossing the national road didier accompanies me etc we are barely 5 years old he remembers discussing santa claus i'll skip all that um and then he says my parents also told me the same story brilliantly i see through their game they invented this story to please me but i never i was never fooled they they let me continue the road he remains in his intellectual positions and this is a child two children talking the memory recalling and i think about my parents who have been telling me this fable since i was young did they tell me stories but about other subjects I remember some of the things that might have been a little arranged in this way and I take it to the next level. Now this is a 5 year old child and an event which now he is recalling as an adult. I like take it to the next level and to them my own parents has someone told stories that they believe due to a lack of lucidity similar to my friend Didier. My intuition whispers to me that yes that is exactly what is happening. everyone here is in illusion no one knows what the truth is anymore it is precisely here at this moment between the bakery and the toy store that i begin to understand i am 5 years old and i am in a world of sleepers then will follow the eternal dilemma is it possible to be right alone against one's cultural environment after dozens of years of reflection for me the answer is yes regardless of the people who teach us here they mainly just reproduce the beliefs that have been instilled in them even if they are the best scientists of the moment they know almost nothing about reality i am aware that what is told here can and should be surprising yet everything is true he is describing what is told in his book it is up to each one of you to conduct your research or else to sleep the rest of your physical life but we wake up sooner or later in this world or another so nothing is serious or definitive the truth is infinitely richer and more beautiful than all the santa claus stories we are told here so that's how he ends that discussion but i'm sharing this because it's a very good example of somebody in whom this barrier between the surface mind and the inner mind has been largely thinned or even um, opened and the result is this complete access to the memory 
I am coming back to the question itself from which I have drifted a little bit, but this was to highlight the importance of the memory and the reduction that take place that takes place when you wake up into the physical brain. In fact, the inner ranges of memory are able to retain a much finer and richer character of the experiences that they have had directly from those states or in those states. The reduction and dulling is only in the physical brain, physical mind. Now what happens when we begin this practice of recalling dreams and hold that intermediate state and even consciously infuse into the physical brain, physical mind, the richness of those, we are building a capacity in the physical brain and physical mind. So you've been in a state, in the dream state or in an out of body experience where you see certain colors. They don't exist in the physical world in the, to the physical eyes. So there's nothing corresponding. You come back and it becomes grey or black or a blank. And often the physical mind replaces by something equivalent. If you pause at that in-between point and hold the memory, gradually the physical brain mind as if learns to recognize this and we build a certain capacity until at some point the physical mind itself begins to widen out, begin to be more filled with light, experience of gradations higher, infused into them and now begins to open to them and even as if is being raised to participate, to be able to register experiences of that grade. This at a very material level is a transmutation or a transformation of the physical mind, physical consciousness. So, just this exercise of recalling dreams slowly and then infusing the character of what is remembered in a higher grade into the physical brain mind as we remember begins to make a change and prepares you for so much more that you can have. Now, why is this important? From a spiritual point of view, it is exactly the same thing that happens from a deeper experience of an inner or higher state of consciousness. Any spiritual experience as it is brought to the surface memory is similarly dimmed, reduced, lost, blurred sometimes in the physical memory. Even this is a common experience for people, you have a deep experience, quite rich, quite intense, even sometimes overwhelming, you come back, at that point the memory is still intact. Two days later, somebody asks you what was that and you've forgotten. And I'm saying this because I see this all the time. And working with people, I often recommend, if you're doing this kind of a practice for some deeper experiences, write it down while it's fresh. And that helps to fix it in the surface memory, in the surface layers. So this is the reason you will see the mother advises, if you want to develop the capacity to remember dreams, then at the moment when you wake up, do not move. The moment you move, your consciousness rapidly is pulled into the surface layers and you lose the depth and the richness of the experience and even the memories fade rapidly. Do not move physically. Just to recall, go back and forth and sometimes repeatedly back and forth, back and forth until you are able to move without losing the continuity. Take the pencil and paper which have been kept next to you with a minimum of opening of eyes and then start writing. You will notice at that point you are holding your consciousness at a grade slightly beyond the full waking physical mind state, slightly on the edge and that's where you will write and the act of writing is fixing it. You write it, you allow yourself to wake up now fully with eyes open, you will read, ah yes this is what I just wrote, but already you will notice details of the memory are fading, but you can at least find a correspondence, ah yes this is what it was. You get up, walk and come back and often you will have forgotten. You take a shower and come back and you reread and you'll say, I don't remember writing this or I don't remember what it was. Of course, the words might you might remember but not the experience. That shows you how disconnected our layers of consciousness are even with eyes open. You can be in a state from which you have zero recall with another state which is also eyes open. So I would highly recommend for all those of you who so feel interested to take up this practice of remembering your dreams. And the method the mother, the mother recommends is you keep a pen and paper next to you on the bed 
before going to sleep you make yourself very still very quiet very relaxed put an intention that as you will drift off into sleep maybe you hold a certain grade of consciousness a certain state that you want to wander into those states not sink into a subconscious tired state and you put an intention that at the moment when you wake up you will pause you will not move you will recall the dream remember go back and forth a few times and then very slowly with a minimum physical movement or opening of eyes you will take up the pen and paper and start writing make sure it's a stiff back on the paper notebook or board cardboard and then start writing as quickly as you can pause again shift back close your eyes shift back recall details that you missed already in, at the point of writing fill in more again close recall go back and forth until you have been able to recall as much detail as you can it doesn't matter what the grade of dream is it's absolutely irrelevant it's this link which you are building which is very precious because it will be of help even in your spiritual development because these are dangers of inner and higher consciousness that you want to bridge with so do this in a few days maybe the first day you'll forget maybe some day it will not happen do not worry just persist for a few days weeks by that time already you will find you remember one dream but you also remember a fragment of the previous and so you pause go back and you'll notice as if backwards you catch the tail and you remember the fragment before you remember that and you remember the fragment before and you go backwards always in the recall and where it seems to blur out or fade away just pause wait and then you'll find you can access a little more the goal is to recall as much as you can with as much detail as you can and also the rich quality of experience of that consciousness which is dulled when you bring it to the surface but stay with that and retain as much as you can all the way to the physical do this again and again for days for weeks there comes a point very quickly now i had got to this sometime in my teenage maybe in the late teenage where i could recall going back all the way to the entry point of the night so the f- entire chain of dreams but later uh, now i understand that it was actually on one level now i should recognize there are also other levels where these took place but still this is a useful achievement that on that level you have the continuity of the dreams and even if you lose out details the fact that you could maintain continu- continuity is very precious now i lost it later when i stopped making the effort so the dullness of your consciousness tends to close the gaps but you've actually formed a thread a continuity of consciousness and then you can build on this i have met with one swami from the ramakrishna mission who i respect very much swami atmarupananda and uh, he shared with me how he developed this early on and to this day at a very late age he is able to retain the full continuity of a part that is conscious during sleep and if the dreams go in a particular direction which he would not like that part can suddenly activate and say ah uh-uh, ah and redirect the dream very useful <laughs> but all this is useful for the spiritual development it will also be useful for any other capacity that you develop for other levels of consciousness including going out of body so i have taken nishikant's question as a starting point to develop much more on the line of dreams and with suggestion of practices which you can do and those of you who find it useful to take up these practices do feel free to share or post in the comments uh, with these talks whenever you have successes it might encourage others also to be able to put into to to take up these practices and uh, develop their capacity we can go to the next question we we'll take another question we received from nick hill my elder sister died of accidental burn in 2021 a few months back i saw her in a dream coming towards me but she didn't looked at me and crossed someone told me in the dream that she was going to to lit dia does it mean that she is presently on the subtle physical plane doing some sadhana for example please clarify me okay by itself from the description it's not obvious what it could be it could also be something from your own subconscious that comes often that happens 
but in this case because of the character of vividness of the dream and the fact that you recall it generally the subconscious dreams wouldn't have uh, the same clarity suggests that there was an experience of some kind now there will be two kinds of dreams of that experience one is an actual interaction with her in one of the subtle gradations the other is a symbolic representation of something that corresponds to her consciousness so this uh, i think i briefly lost the thread when i was discussing with nishikant's question of types of dreams i started speaking of the symbolic level of dreams so maybe this is a good point to fill complete that things happen on other levels you are here in your dream state and there are other things happening on other levels not only vertically but subliminally in inner ranges as i said and that became the point of discussion for multiple dreams and multiple layers so there are many layers many things happening on all levels in all parts of your consciousness not all those come to the surface so primarily what comes close from closest to the surface is your dream but there could be things happening on other levels which then reflect on the lower levels and those we would call symbolic the problem with symbolism is something which was essentially of a higher grade of quality of consciousness which can't be registered on the lower because there is nothing corresponding to it now is retained by its corresponding element that exists here that's why it's a symbol so something they known let's say in an intuitive grade of consciousness or something happening on an intuitive plane has no correspondence to your physical mind or even the intellectual mind what happens then is the corresponding vibrational quality here gets activated for the other thing the corresponding vibration quality gets activated and it's as if played out in forms names objects which each correspond to something higher when you look at this it seems to make no sense but if you stop become very quiet and feel the vibrational quality behind then sometimes you get a very clear impression and uh, it takes a while to develop this capacity to become very quiet and feel the thing behind and then sometimes even you may say ah yes this corresponds to something which i already know deep within me intuitively but which i am not normally conscious on the surface let's say i'm just going to take an example which i'd heard someone narrate so this person narrates how he was at the the bottom of a maybe perhaps a ledge above was somebody who was himself and then here he was doing some movement of moving his legs as if cycling to climb and with that he was rising but on the other side the other person was pulling him something like this some strange thing like this and he had to move his legs although it made no difference but he had to move and he it did, he couldn't understand i think he was not aware the other part somebody was pulling he didn't know who so the sense of the dream if you just stop you're making an effort somebody is pulling you you immediately it suggests uh, a, a meaning but a deeper meaning and if you interpret each of these things as as if a part of your own consciousness so your higher part let's say is trying to draw you your lower part is making an effort cycling which gets nowhere you're just whirling on the same spot but if you don't do that there is no effort you go to sleep the act of making an effort holding an aspiration keeps you ready and respond receptive to the action of effort from above so a higher grade of consciousness is drawing you maybe your own higher part or the divine consciousness the mother's consciousness drawing you and the fact that you want to grow you want to aspire you want to wake up that intention and the effort that comes in that wanting is the element required now at this point you see already it's describing a spiritual relationship with a higher grade of consciousness presence of the mother or your own higher consciousness that draws you and the lower which makes the effort and suddenly it is of a completely different order but this is an experience in itself in its purity there's very few of us who would be able to hold and retain as a memory from a higher grade it would inevitably reflect into a lower grade through their corresponding vibrational forms symbols and then you have this weird dream i'm 
trying to cycle, someone is pulling me up, and then the link in between would be seen as a ladder, I think that's what the description was, and as if the person above is pulling the ladder and I'm holding the ladder and clinging to it, which if you reduce to its form terms, would be meaningless, and even some silly dream you would dismiss. And yet it corresponds to a deep experience and a deep spiritual truth of something that's happening within you in your sadhana. So I'm just giving this as an example and then I come to now Nikhil's proper experience. She was going to light Diya, somebody told. Who is this somebody? Which is interesting, which often happens in the dream. Somebody says. And often this is a symbolic representation of an intuitive part of you that knows. And so the details are difficult to interpret in itself, but if you become very quiet, so there's something happening with regard to your sister who has died accidentally and she is going to do something which involves as if lighting a lamp, the eyes lamp, something which involves an awakening or an aspiration or some activity of initiation of beginning of some kind and she doesn't look at you because in her consciousness the focus is clearly on that thing she is going for, you are no more a part of it. And so to me the suggestion on a more intuitive layer would be as if she is preparing to take birth. Because the life was cut short, 2021, it's almost three years now since uh, that accident happened, that she is as if preparing to take birth. She is moving straight in a one-pointed focus towards that. You are there because you knew her, you feel something connection with her, but she has no more a connection with you. She is now focused on the new incarnation she will take. So she passes right by you and then the intuition or some inner voice or some higher being or some indicator says she is going to light a lamp, dia. Dia even, if you look at the sense of that, could be easily the sense of incarnation or beginning of a new life, etc. So it's my suggestion, I don't see, I won't say more, more than that, but I'm showing you how you would, the process by which you would glimpse the underlying truth behind a symbolic dream. Do not go, do not make the mistake of looking up these dic dream dictionaries or things like that. They are not reliable at all. Somebody has read a book and they say, ah yes, this means that, that means that. Sometimes, not always. A lot of these are culturally dependent and so on. Another example somebody shared, someone here had a dream, he saw a child and says, oh my God, I don't want to have children. That's the waking consciousness reacting. But what was it? And the mother gives you this indication, I think Sri Aurobindo speaks of this, that generally seeing a child in the dream represents a psychic being. So a closeness felt with the psychic presence and the perception on the waking up in the symbolic layer of consciousness, the symbolism would be seen as a child sometimes. But the surface mind now interprets totally differently. It does not have the feel of what it is. So I'm giving examples. Yes, it may be useful sometimes to have a background, but then stay with the background of what, what is relevant within your cultural context or what has a deeper psychic character of the symbolism. You don't go blindly with uh, these dream dictionaries. I've had a look at these things, seen some of these dictionaries. They're very superficial, very reductions. Sometimes they may have a truth to it, but if you reduce it to those terms of those words, you've lost the point. The truth is on a grade of consciousness which is different. Do not cling to words. Go back rather to the vibrational essence behind, of which this is a symbol. And then there you'll get the glimpse and even perhaps touch something of the experience that you had on those deeper and higher levels. It may even help to awaken that experience or make you conscious to receive the nudge, the push, the knowledge, the thing which is being given to you on that higher level to receive it here on the surface part. And so it's worth the effort. And if you have done a little bit of work of recalling dream or in emerging from a deep, emerging from a deep meditation to build this continuity of consciousness, all this will become much easier. I think we can go to the next question. So Eric is writing, I tend to regularly remember dreams to some extent, and every now and then I have lucid dreams, although much of the time I found that my dreams seems to be a working out of the subconscious content. 
However, one morning upon awakening, the name Nolini Kant Gupta was going through my mind over and over again, repeating itself like a mantra. I did not have any retention of dreams from that evening, but there was this palpable presence of his name like a mantra in my consciousness for a short time as I transitioned from sleeping to being awake. Until then, I had only heard of Nolini and knew him to be a disciple, but nothing more than that. I was not exactly sure how to make sense of this, but I took the experience as an opportunity to learn more about him and to read from his collected works and have felt a heartfelt connection with him. Although I'm deeply touched by many disciples of Mother and Sri Aurobindo, Nolini's inspiration and writings have become particularly dear to me. I have not known how to interpret the experience that I had, and I'm wondering, could you perhaps shed any light on this? Mm -hmm. So the background we have already built will now be useful to get a sense of this also. Uh, though generally speaking, two things could be happening. One is that in some inner part, there was a contact with either the personality of Nolini Kanta Gupta or something in the intuitive part of you relating to a particular experience. You have had a touch of that suggestion or this is the second option that some past connection that you might have with that person or some affinity in consciousness of your temperament with something of his could have popped up. I'm not saying necessarily it has to do with past life. I'm saying just an affinity even is enough for the present life. Similarly, for the first uh, example I give, an intuition or something specific in that point of contact. One of these broadly, and within each of these you see the two variations. One of these broadly, so to say, percolated to the surface consciousness which then because you took it up and began to read, you discovered that you had a special affinity to certain things he is writing or his style of writing or his consciousness, whichever it is. And it could come from any of these things. It may also happen over time. If it's the first case, then over time you might discover as your consciousness shifts or the need within you shifts, somebody else now fills much more that particular quality of your current need. If it is of the second type, that is a more personal connection which is generic to this life, then you might find this might stay much longer through much of your life. So it could be any of these. As by itself, I will not be able to go more, but you might become very quiet and try to feel if there's something along these lines. Nevertheless, the point is it helped you. It helped you and awoke in you a certain affinity which was latent perhaps and has grown. So we can understand these things more easily with the background of what we have discussed before. So all this now, I think this covers the questions which came from last time. I'll just take a quick look at the chat box. <laughs> okay, Nikhil asks, in 1991, I saw you for the first time in dream. Three or four days later, I saw your photo in the All India magazine. Did my subtle body come out of my gross body and meet you in 1991? That is possible, but it's equally possible that one picks up things on a deeper level without even meeting in subtle body. I'll elaborate on this. It is also possible that in the deeper higher layers, you perceive things which are going to happen. It doesn't mean your subtle body is going to meet the person, but something as an event that's going to happen connects. Or some, as in the example earlier of uh, Eric's uh, narration, somebody whose influence might have impacted you strongly, before the, you meet the person physically, you touch something of the influence already and there's a contact taking place and you pick it up. In any of these variations, but you can see that it's all common, there's a common feature, but the forms of it could be many. Sri Aurobindo explains, I elaborate on this point now, Sri Aurobindo explains that in fact, a lot of things happen 
in the inner and higher ranges of which we have absolutely no memory on the surface. Things happen where we, we have contact with influences, events, people, circumstances, perceptions of things, suggestions of possible future outcomes, influences, and our state in response to those influences impacts those events. And this whole complex interaction that takes place. If we were conscious on those levels, we could actually register and even modify those tendencies. But what happens normally is an automatic outcome of the state in which we live and the nature of our current evolution, which impacts those, all those things. Let me put it another way. On a very material level, if there is about to be a shocking impact suddenly, something in us which is already sensing the imminent shock braces itself. And this is measurable. I've given examples of this in the past with regard to the 9-11 attack and other examples. If you're conscious, in the dream state you will notice if there's a loud physical sound which wakes you up and you are pulled back with a shock, if you're conscious at that moment you will recall that the movement of waking began before you heard the sharp sound. This is very important. Because in that subtler body, subtler state, in the subtle regions, even without being out of the body, in our higher and inner ranges, we sense the future all the time. Uh, hello? Yes. Hello? Is there a problem? Alina? Is there a break in the continuity? Shadalu? Yes. I think there is there was a, there was a break? voice break, but yes, but um, I was not sure if it's my internet or it's ah, okay. yours. So I only okay, heard so... the last part with the after. Yeah. Okay. So I, if, I okay, there was no problem. Okay, after there's that, no problem the on the mainstream. It's fine. Maybe it's some people can confirm on YouTube. No, uh, no, they've said it's fine. There's okay. No Okay. Okay, then. So, coming yeah. back to this. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, pick up the thread again. Uh, in this, things happening on other levels represent or, or the outcome of those interactions is the result of our state of consciousness. And if we can become conscious on those levels, we can actually impact those circumstances. And Sri Aurobindo explains that things happen on those levels of which we have no memory, no conscious awareness here, but there's a huge range of activity that takes place on those levels. And when we begin to become more conscious, we can actively influence circumstances and events. And we have a sense as if to be able to, when an impact is going to happen, which is intense, on those higher or inner levels, we already sense the intensity of what's coming because on those levels we are able to, because that's the nature of the consciousness on those levels. And it ripples through to the surface consciousness, already something within us begins to brace. We don't know why. This is what happens with animals. When we say by instinct they sense an earthquake and know to go in the opposite direction of the earthquake. You see, if it was a purely physical sensation, as scientists believe, oh, they feel the tremors, oh, they feel electric fields, that's not enough to explain which direction they should run, isn't it? <laughs> because the electric field is all around you. There is this deeper intuitive layer or the instinctive layer as intuition reflected in the vital body, in which not only you have felt the tension of the event to occur as if the impact has already hit you, but also which direction it feels less intense and the push to go into that direction and run away. And this is very specific knowledge held on deeper and higher ranges which reflects in you. So this shows you that uh, a lot happens on those levels. And sometimes when somebody uh, we meet where there is a strong influence of some kind which might affect our life, often things are registered higher up in some way. It could be something of that kind, or it could be something that you you were about to see that photograph, something, and you picked up. So, But what I'm saying is this is normal. You should not think anything unusual about it. 
And the more we become conscious, the more we begin to sense or perceive. If we are very conscious, not always necessarily informed, but you will sense the direction in which events are moving. And that's, uh, that's an interesting feel. You will feel as if, ah, something positive is about to happen. Or sometimes something is foreboding. Now you don't know what it is, but at least you know this. And then you, you, as you develop the ability to, let's say, build the continuity across these layers, you may even have clearer glimpses. So, Revati is asking, what about the silver cord? I will keep this question for later because we have, today at least we have not yet moved into the out of body nature of experiences, but we will we'll discuss that later. V Truth, it seems a good idea to consult psychologists at age 14 to determine the lives of future occupation for kids. Nice takeaway point from Mark's life. No, I would defer. I would defer very much because uh, 14 is too early. Your personality has not yet sufficiently matured. If the psychologist was sufficiently spiritually endowed and intuitively endowed, it would be useful. But then you don't need to do at 14, you can even do that at 8, you can do it at 5. <laughs> you can already say, ah, this person will have a broad stream in this direction. But a psychologist who is going to assess based on your current ten trends, interests and uh, tendencies or capacities, it's premature. And it would be extremely harmful to intervene at that point and say, you should do this and not do that. And unfortunately today, because of career orientation and the nature of our education, which is so narrow and reductionist, and the parents' obsession with pushing you into a narrow career track, this is being done more and more. It is extremely harmful. I would say, allow the flower to bloom with all its petals first. Before you can say, which is the direction, the quality, the expression of the flower. And that does not happen until quite much later. Even I've seen in some cases, the blooming has taken place around by the age of 25. Some unusually have a blooming earlier, but in a narrow track. And if you say now stay with that track and not widen further, you've already narrowed them because that's going to be for you a success career. No, that's not what you're here for. You're here for the full unfolding of all your possibilities. So as a general rule, I recommend for everybody, do not limit yourself. Widen as much as possible, at least till the age of 25. Widen as much as possible because your faculties are still unfolding. Play with every possible kind of learning experience. Of course, necessarily healthy learning experiences of all kinds. Learn to place and develop skills of various kinds, even if it's just for fun, for a week or two, for a month or two. Play, learn to play a musical instrument, sing, dance, uh, gymnastics, all kinds of skills. Everything, irrespective of your natural tendencies and capacities, widen the full spectrum. Do not interfere at an early age and narrow a person down. So I personally think that psychologist intervening uh, that early is extremely harmful. By the time you have a full blooming, you won't need a psychologist. Or if you need a psychologist, it's because either you have very rich, capacities or your individualization has not been sufficiently integrated with the soul aspiration and you are lost, you don't know what to do because you are chasing fake dreams, fake forms. If sufficient integration has happened, you will know at least which direction to go. Doesn't mean you will be, that will be a career line, but you will know what to do. So, I don't know what Shanta means by Kura Thalwar example, maybe you can elaborate. Uh, Rampal asks, I use an alarm to wake up, is that okay? I still remember dreams now and again. It is if you need to, but for dream recall, the best would be you don't have a shock that wakes you up. Okay, there are two advantages to alarm. One is that you might be in a deep sleep state when you get pulled out. And as a result, you will remember the dream more easily. But of course, the disadvantage would be then that uh, you have the shock, etc. But there is a benefit and I found the best recall of dreams have been when I was pulled out from very deep by an external shock. Otherwise, there is a slow return and with the slow return, there is a slow forgetfulness and by the time you wake up fully, you have pretty much lost everything. But if you have built the link, then with a the slow return also you can retain it. Um, 
So it's okay. I think you you, sh you can experiment with or without alarm, see what works. Uh, one of the methods people use for building this capacity is actually to set an alarm in the middle of the night at an odd hour to forcefully pull you out from the deep state and then so you're forced to recall dreams. And you'll be surprised at the kind of deep uh, memory of dreams that you get when you do that. I don't recommend it because it will affect you physically. You should of course go back to sleep afterwards. But if you have a heavy day, do not do such things because then it will tire the body, prevent you from having uh, sufficient rest. There is a method which Mark Oban recommends, which we will come to later when we talk about it, where he says to wake up at about 3 o'clock and then go back to sleep and then you have the outer body experience in that second cycle of sleep. The rationale for that we will look at later. But for that also you might want to have, that would be the second benefit of the alarm to wake you up. But we'll discuss in detail later. Uh, Sagar Sharma is saying, Mark Oban said, life is not crush at all and we choose to enter this life. I don't know what you mean. But it's if this is what you mean, that we always choose. Yes, it's a fact, we all choose to take birth. It's always the soul's choice. It is never a compulsion, unless of course we are immature souls, half conscious even at the level as a soul. And so we are as if compelled by the evolutionary push to be helplessly carried. But for most people, the soul is sufficiently conscious and especially if you have an active spiritual life, that's because the soul is sufficiently conscious and developed that always a choice was made. And even often the choice is of the kind of space in which you incarnate. Turbanless is asking, how do we prevent bad dreams? I'm doing Kriya Sadhana and Gayatri Sadhana, but I find myself having bad dreams. As if some bad entity is trying to stop me from doing Japa. Uh, it's not really uh, the Sadhana you do. It is the state in which you go to sleep that makes for the dream to be whatever it is. You must understand, especially when it concerns the night, the quality of consciousness in which you enter the sleep is the quality of consciousness in which you exit the sleep and therefore is generally the quality of consciousness in which you are through most of the night. So the thing to do, it's not so much what sadhana you did, the thing to do is to shift your grade of consciousness to a grade which is the state that you would want to come out in. So if you're extremely tired, as we say, dead tired, exhausted, you're often at a very low grade, very physically based and then you enter in that state, you exit also tired and the dreams are of that grade, of the physical grade of consciousness and you enter into worlds which correspond to those grades which are dark, dull, heavy and often uh, with beings not so nasty, uh, beings who are nasty, not so nice. What you could do? One of the practices which people find helpful, you read a text such as Savitri. Pick a portion where in reading you feel your consciousness uplifted. The mother suggests another thing. Put yourself into a state of clarity and freshness. If you want to do a concentration, dwell on the divine, feel the divine presence. But bring yourself into a state of uh, freshness. Even she said, take a shower, come to concentration, wait, come, come into a freshness. And then go to sleep, which is somewhat fresh. Your body is tired, but consciousness-wise, you're not in the dullness of the tiredness. You're in a fresher grade. And you will wake up fresh with your body fresh. But also your consciousness will be on a higher grade. The things you think about before going to sleep, the kinds of uh, discussion you have, the movies you might watch, if you're exposed to television, all these can affect the level at which you are. Often what people do, and it's, a, it's, not the, it's one of the worst things to do, you, they watch the news while on the television, while eating dinner. As you're eating food, the vibrations and the news is often the most ugly, the most crude, the most coarse, the most false, which is being pumped into you, is being eaten with the food, so to say, vibrationally. And so afterwards you may do something, but your body has already been pulled into that grade of consciousness. So certainly if you, I would normally recommend do not waste time watching the news on television. 
you can scan through 20, 30 headlines in the same time. Do that instead and pick what is for you relevant. Do not waste time, especially do not open yourself to those vibrations. Often they are the most crude and ugly and hammered away. They repeat the same images again and again. And you'll find yourself visually hypnotized because the image is changing and each time your mind says, oh, perhaps there's something new. Oh, is there something new? No, it's the same. Oh, this time it will change. No, it's not. And you keep going back and forth and that's how they hook you. Cut it, switch it off. You want to watch a movie, watch a movie. But don't watch the news because it's the most useless thing you could do because somebody decides what will excite you and hook you. Not what will be useful for you, what will change your consciousness. And they are always hitting the lowest common denominator of fear, ugliness, hatred, anger, etc. Stop the news, do not watch on TV. If you want to read through, scan headlines, pick up what you think useful. Even newspaper, first scan headlines, pick what you want and discard the newspaper. Taking the newspaper in your hands also brings very dull, heavy, dark vibes. Be conscious and then make your choices. What you could do then is consciously shift using the means I've already described. Shift your level, hold that state and drift into sleep in that state. You will go into that grade where also when you interact with things or beings or events, it will be of a higher quality. You will not have those types of bad dreams or you will not meet bad entities who try to harm you. Mm. Nikhil asks, are we related from previous life? All of us are part of a spiritual family. All of us in that sense are related and as equally children of the Divine Mother. You remember this talk that she gave in the playground where she told all those assembled there, which were adults as well as children, she said, all of you were promised that when the time of fulfillment came, you would be given a chance. And then she says, you don't remember, but I remember. And she said, that's why you're here. But then it's also left to us what we make with the chance given to us. So in a sense, yes, we are all related. It doesn't have to be interacting personally in the previous life, but aligned in the similar common aspiration, which is what makes us, in that sense, a spiritual family. I meet, I have met often people who were in a completely different tradition spiritually, but in alignment of aspiration and a vibrational quality of purpose, sense of purpose, it was such a beautiful alignment. I could have said, oh, we were literally brothers or sisters. And that happens, it's not uh, so common, but it has happened and it does not matter what the tradition is, it is this alignment. And then we can even perhaps say, oh, we might have met, maybe, does it matter? What we do today with this life is what matters. Verina is saying, and also sometimes it is necessary to take deviations or to go in a wrong direction as part of the evolutionary path. I think this is in uh, regard to the psychologist intervening at age 14. Yes, that's an important point because part of our evolution is also to make mistakes and learn from mistakes to be able to find our clear paths. And the mistakes are often needed to compensate for certain tendencies of our nature which tend to that mistake and having made that mistake we can correct. So yes, the path ahead is complex especially if your personality is rich and multifaceted, it can be far more complex. Do not ever interfere at that kind of an early age, unless you have some true spiritual or intuitive insight. And then you can help the child, nudge him in the right direction, but again, not in a narrow way, but broadly in what tendencies that they can, so to say, draw upon in their forward movement. For somebody, it may be a very knowledge-based person, it will be, ah, yes, you have an inquisitive mind, you have a curious mind, you should explore more. Somebody, it may be a sense of courage, oh, you're a courageous person, you should explore more and develop your capacities. But everywhere the nudge is for widening, but along the lines that correspond to their temperament. Tutun says, I have sometimes experienced suddenly awakening with the body having a jerk. Then, yes, this is a common for most of us that as you're drifting into sleep often, the subtle body is just beginning to separate 
and as it begins to separate you have this sense of floating and because your body is still half awake not fully asleep the subtle body beginning to separate the floating in the subtle body is registered in the physical body as if your bed is moving or you are drifting as if you are slipping and that of course creates a tension in the physical body pulls back the subtle body and you fall back with a jerk the sense of a jerk is always the subtle body pulled back suddenly and the shock of that reconnection sometimes when the reconnection is not aligned so the two do not align correctly you are slightly off it feels as if your body is unable to move or you are half in half out and so your body is unable to move and you have what they call sleep paralysis uh, or you have a sense of the nerves being jangled as if shaken up because of the misalignment in the sudden return in all such cases simply relax and allow the thing to realign and very quickly the disturbance goes and you settle if it is a sleep paralysis you can also use that occasion to consciously drift off and say ah yes i am half in in my subtle physical i am half in the subtle half in the in the physical let me just float away and feel yourself drifting off and either you will drift off into sleep or you will find yourself drifting in your subtle body <laughs> maureen asks is there a correspondence between the experience of color described by goethe in waking state and the experience of color in dream state the experience of color in the dream is more complete and she asks the waking uh, experience of color being very partial and goethe straddling multiple realities i don't think so from what i understood goethe's description of colors is of a physical description uh, of the border between dark and light i showed that on the prism last time when the light goes from dark to white from black to white it's one shade of color when it goes white to black it's another shade of color and this seems to be almost a physical phenomenon on the physical world in the subtle worlds the sense of color is very different they are much more rich deep wider in range or translucent brilliant in a way which is indescribable to us and sometimes what you see on the computer screen in terms of richness and vividness which is so different from what you could get from the paint is one very physical sense of how different it can be so you draw with paint watercolors or pastels or whatever and then you draw on the computer screen with colors where they can be almost luminescent and you see the difference you cannot get that luminescence in the physical paints easily at least so the mother gives this example she says that the range in the subtle worlds is so much richer and so much more deep and so much more uh, translucent and luminescent and then she says one day science will f- or we will find a way to represent something of that physically and the closest that i feel this has come to is in the quality of colors on the computer screen which is computer monitor as distinct from television where the monitor the range of colors is also more uh, precise and more rich and you can get shades and colors and brilliances and which you can intensify and make luminescent in ways that you could never do with paint but this difference is nothing compared to the difference between this and what is in the subtle worlds there you can have colors that you see and then you have no word for it in the in the physical world they exist that's how it is if i may give an example and i don't know if it would be complete to say it in this way but it would give you an idea in the physical world we find mixing three colors allows us to represent all colors okay once you have that or with light three colors and you can vary and get all the colors that you are physically capable of seeing and i believe that corresponds to our physical sights Uh, rods and cones being sensitive to three and then using that as a means of recognizing other colors if you had equivalent of not three but four or five or 10 or as is the case with the cuttlefish i believe it is the most rich it has 17 kinds of sensors and all its color perceptions are a combination of 17 qualities or 17 senses perhaps on the physical world it sees more richly already 
But still in all these there is a translation through rods and cones. A translation of something which is perceived which is translated even though much more richly now. When you go into the subtle body, you do not have that translation process at all. You see things for what they are, of course depending on levels. So the lower levels you will have more dulling, reduction. I am speaking now of the higher ranges. Even in the higher vital, you will have the full spectrum of all possibilities. And then you can even literally say there is an infinity of colors without limit in every way, every direction. So you would have as if uh, that would be the truest perception in the highest supramental consciousness. You need as if an infinity of sensors to appreciate an infinity of colors. Perhaps that gives you a sense of what actually is possible as one goes further out into the higher ranges. Maya says, Salvador Dali would fall asleep with a spoon in his hand so that it would, it would fall and clatter when he drifted off into sleep and he would be able to remember and paint his surreal dreams. That's an interesting experiment and you can do variations of that. For example, you keep one arm as if raised and so at the moment you fall asleep, the arm moves and that makes you wake up with a jerk. But to me, yes, maybe they are useful as a start, but to me what would be more useful is you build the capacity to shift your consciousness into deeper inner and higher ranges consciously. To get to that state, perceive and then come back with the full retention and continuity of awareness. And this would be a superior way from a yoga point of view. If your goal is merely to catch those glimpses and do something, yes, one can use such methods. Uh, so well, was uh, Maureen is asking, was Goethe straddling multiple realities? It's possible. I think all artists, all creators generally, draw from the higher ranges. Whether they are conscious or not is the difference. But all of them draw from the higher ranges. Even if you are going to write a beautiful story or a novel, what do you do when you sit down? What will I write? Something within you as if turns up to receive an insight and say, aha, I've got it, I've got the idea, I've got the inspiration. Where did it come from? It came from above. From your own higher ranges, we might say. But what did you do for it? Nothing. You just turned up waiting for it. It gave you. But imagine if you could simply rise into that higher state, literally scoop out, <laughs> as if you take a bowl to the ocean and scoop out and bring with you. Or better still, as if you rise into the ocean and merge with the ocean and come back with a wave of the ocean. These are all possible for all of us. And I am not saying this as something difficult. This is well within our reach. This is what happens to us unconsciously even when we have these in a dream or in meditation or in any of these uh, interiorized states when you get an inspiration or intuition. But develop the capacity more and more to do this consciously. Uh, I think today we will just stay with the questions. E.T. is asking, I had a dream in which I had gone to sell a ring and a book to what looked like a bookstore. At the end, I read a few pages and decided to not sell it. What could it mean? I don't want this to become a <laughs> dream discussion only, but uh, the idea, the goal, maybe today we'll just limit it, we'll, we'll take whatever comes. But the goal being to show you how it is to be done. Maybe what I am saying is not it, but I am showing you the broad approach you will take to get to the deeper perception of it. Obviously, this was a significant dream, not only because of the way you recall it, but it's obvious to you it had to do something with wanting to give away something and then holding it back because you discovered something precious in it. Book, the natural sense of it, if you feel behind, is the sense of knowledge or experience or something which is a large quantity of knowledge or experience gathered into a compacted bundle. Now what happens, and you will find this uh, very often described in Mark's book. Um, I got an email from somebody who said uh, they couldn't find the, the, the website where to buy this. It is Deepti Publications, D-I-P-T-I publications.com and you'll find the book uh, listed there. Um, so, one of the things you'll find in this book, Mark often speaks of how he met some beings and then they communicated a bundle of knowledge. 
Now, this is what happens in the higher levels. You want to convey something. Unlike the physical body where we have to talk because we can't read each other's minds because of the dullness of the physical mind and the physical brain, you have to translate thoughts into words, words to be heard assuming there is clarity of the transmission or maybe you have a break of the internet. And on the other side, hopefully they've heard the right words, but then hopefully they understood the right meaning because the same words might mean different to different people. And then again, a translation to the understanding that it entails. And if somebody tries to convey a complex idea and the receiving mind has not sufficiently developed complexity, then you'll find it gets reduced to what the capacity was. Okay, it's the same way as the dulling of the colors. There's a dulling of experience. On a physical level, the same thing happens. But now you remem remove all the physical layers which involve translation. Take all this out. What do you have? An experience in the sender, an experience registered in the receiver. Let's assume that the receiver has the full capacity and scope. And straight an imprint of the experience takes place. Poof, just like that. Now imagine a person has had a travel and a journey and a learning experience of 20 days. You meet an imprint. Suddenly 20 days of rich experience is now yours. Your physical brain is unable to handle this kind of thing. What do you have to do with your physical brain? Wait, wait, I need to integrate slowly. I go through one by one, first day, second day, third day, and then go back and forth. Oh my God, this is too much happening within a few seconds. I need to <laughs> remember 20 days that you took to integrate is com compressed into a few seconds. Back and forth, integrate, hold. You can't. Your surface mind can't. Inner mind can. Inner mind, how does it do? It received the imprint. You wait. And mother's guidance is stay as still as possible. Don't rush to interpret. Don't rush to think. Stay as still as possible and let it settle into you. She gives this analogy as if you go on top of a tower and you receive an intuition and it comes into you instead of the mind rushing to jump. Ah, I caught the tail and just take a piece of it. You wait for it to come down, come down, sink into you, settle into you as completely as possible by staying totally still. It fills you and then slowly integrates over a few days, maybe 20 days. <laughs> Remember you had 20 days of experience. So it takes 20 days to integrate, no problem. And over about 20 days, you'll say, ah, yes, my God, it's as if I have lived those 20 days of that person's experience and I have the same experience or richness, content of learning, whatever it is. Because it takes time on the surface layers to integrate. But in the subtle body, just like that, Poof, a bundle sent. For the integration, days together, sometimes years. I don't remember if it is in the book, Mark recalls something he had received as a bundle from one of the one of the beings. And it took him a few years to fully appreciate the quality and the content which had been transmitted. But like I said now, assuming we had the same recept the sufficient receptivity, we are generally like this. And what is given is much larger. So it's as if absorbed condensed, compressed, maybe diluted, maybe reduced, perhaps. But hopefully, if the person transmitting is sufficiently capable, they're able to concentrate the material and you're sufficiently quiet, even if it's beyond your capacity, you receive the bundle and you wait, wait, wait for it to be absorbed, received and allow it to unfold itself, allow it to find its forms, allow it to find its words and integrate then over a few days, weeks, months, years, whatever it takes, doesn't matter. You will have the full, and it will actually open out your capacity to receive and understand. So a series of such infu infusions, each time would widen your capacity, each time would become larger, until at some point you would grow enough to be able to receive the whole thing as it is. You will remember the mother narrating this to my teacher M.P. Pandit, when his teacher Kapali Shastriya left his body, I think 1954 or 53. When he left his body, soon after, early 60s, the mother had uh, started using the repetition of a mantra for the body's cells. She found it helpful for the cells. And so at that point, she said, he came to her. He was in the range of the higher mind, she said. From there, he came to her and told her, I'm happy to see that you're interested in the knowledge of mantras. 
if you like, I will give you all the knowledge that I have. And then the mother said, so I opened myself and he poured all his knowledge into me. Isn't that so amazing, so cool, so simple. All of us have this capacity, potentially at least. How much you're able to receive and retain, that's really your capacity that needs to grow. But the capacity to open to receive, especially in the subtle inner and higher ranges of consciousness, it's already there. So in fact, in the vital mental bodies, generally in the subtle bodies, that's how knowledge is transmitted. You don't need words. You can convey an entire book in one go, an entire equivalent of a paragraph. You know, you don't need words or one word spoken as a vibrational quality, but the punch of the content is something enormous. And so what happens in the physical world, the Rishi said, is there a way we can capture all that and hold in a physical notation that is also compact? And this is the basis of the sutra or the aphorism. And you'll find in Sri Aurobindo's thoughts and aphorisms, this is what he does. Each of the aphorisms is like a bundle of concentration of something much larger. If you read it purely in the rational, intellectual way, oh, it's a, such a nice idea, but it as if breaks some boundaries, something happens, says, whoa, what happened? And you stop. If you make yourself very quiet and open and open to a deeper, wider, inner, maybe even intuitive consciousness or an influence of intuition, and then read, it's like, whoa, what was that? And if you have to translate into words, it's going to take me many paragraphs to fully explain, but it's received and you stay very quiet, don't rush to speak and express and then let it soak in, let it shape you. Reread a few times. That's the whole point of his, him giving us those aphorisms, by the way. But okay, so all this was a digression perhaps, but it's an occasion drawing from E.T.'s question, a book. Now you understand what a book represents, content of knowledge, or experience gathered, concentrated. So you have got a book. What is a ring to you? What does it mean? Symbol of something that is like an allegiance or a protection or a representation. Because what does a ring hold? A symbol of what? Of something which is your authority or something which is a protection or something which is an allegiance, whatever that means. But you see the sense of it now. The book, knowledge and this some aspect, I would say, of quality of power. You see, power given to you or to which you have aligned. So, knowledge, power, maybe. So, don't go strictly by what I say. I'm just getting, giving a feel of what, how I would do it, how I, what I perceive, and maybe you find your own. Knowledge, power. You're about to sell it to a bookstore, what looks like a bookstore. So, things people have discarded or others might take, and you're about to give away. At the end, I read a few pages, she writes, and decided not to sell it. You read a few pages. What did it have? What was it which was precious? And you said, no, this is to be kept. Why were you going to sell? So try to feel there, and then you might get a glimpse of it. So there was something which you had, which you were about to give away, but to sell in exchange for something else. What does that mean? As if in your life, perhaps you were at a decision point where you had something precious, but you were hankering out for something else. And maybe there was a choice to be made. To gain that, you would give away this. Maybe there was a life choice involved where you would have to choose paths. Stay with this or discard this in favor of something else. And the dream catches that state of consciousness, of circumstances, the turn of life where something would be precious would be given up in return for something else, which in this case, as you sell, means money, but nowhere in the dream that sense of money comes. But it basically means giving this up in return for something else, which is not important. It's so unimportant, it wasn't even represented in the dream. And then you decide, no, I'm going to keep this. And life takes a certain turn, or a choice is made on a higher level. So I'm giving a way in which you could perceive what that dream meant, a choice made on some level, but what in, it involved would have been something broadly along these lines. I think that should be enough for E.T.'s question. 
Kim is asking, can you touch on visit in dream state from family or friends that have passed away? Mm. It depends if uh, it's something far back. So often you remember or see somebody who's long ago gone, who even in your consciousness is not so much present. Very likely they have reincarnated already. Maybe a grandmother, great-grandmother, or even a parent who you have lost 20 years ago. And then suddenly in the dream you see they have died, and then you are crying. This is an example Sri Aurobindo gives. Death of somebody who was close to you, but they have already died, so what's the big deal? Uh, he says, often this represents some part of your consciousness which was attached, or represents the past attachment. So a grade of consciousness which is now belonging to the past, now which has been discarded. It's dead, it's gone. But what that grade represented was because it corresponded to something of that form, of that person, or of that attachment to family, or something which held you in the past to your family identity, or your past values which you associated with the family of certain uh, traditional beliefs, or attachments, or preferences, or habits of some kind. You see, it all relates to something of the past which was stuck, and now that has been lost, it's broken away, it's died you are free of it. Another example he gives of teeth falling, which is similar, of something which represents the, an inconscient, rigid, tense, hard, uh, sticky things relating to past, dead, broke, breaking or falling, uh, things like that. So, it could be many things. Your question is too broad, Kim's question is too broad. So, it could be in any of these things. Uh, it could also be that you have a visit actually from somebody who's uh, passed on. If it's within a few years of their passing, it could even be a visit of some kind, where you had a brief contact. Um, it so happens that after we go on the other side, we do spend time wandering around. Depending on the degree of awakening, we might be stuck in some intermediate grade, wandering, helplessly repeating our mechanical life here. Or we may have actually moved on into uh, higher ranges where we are conscious that we are free of the physical world and can experience many things or we go into deep state of uh, what Sri Aurobindo describes as the soul in its uh, uh, sleep, which is a conscious sleep of uh, integration of life experience in preparation for the next life, on the level which is our current evolutionary level. But even in that state, when it's partly indrawn, if there was a deep connection, and especially if there's a psychic or spiritual connection, sometimes the being can sense a need on your part and a part of the consciousness might reach out and convey something to you and then withdraw especially if there was a deep spiritual or psychic connection and you might feel that person or the form of that person through whom a message comes or something communicated or felt again you may not remember on the surface but still something might have been received on an inner layer and even would might impact you so a lot depends on the nature of the interaction i would always say do not focus on forms you will see in all that I have described so far, focus on the quality of consciousness, focus on what is behind the form and you will get a clear sense of what it means. I think I will finish with the last two questions. One is a comment, Navaja says, it is noted that Mone after his cataract operation was able to see in the UV range. That is interesting, I did not know that. But what is interesting to note, in the cataract operation there is nothing physically to give you the opening to the ultraviolet range. Interesting, isn't it? You are replaced by another of the cataract, let's say, or even a glass. Nothing in the cataract which really reduces or prevents you uh, to, which blocks out UV, uh, or in the healthy lens which would block out UV, that you replace the lens and suddenly you see UV. It's rather something happened, an intervention of the physical eyes, and the shock of that intervention awakened some deeper capacity which is, was already inherent. And because as an artist he has focused all his life on the perception of colors and really infused his consciousness into the eyes so much that that particular shock would be enough to trigger an awakening of something of a deeper capacity which is already latent. So my point is, it's not that the physical thing did it, at best it acted as a trigger, it is the inherent quality of perception awaiting readiness for which the trigger was enough to awaken the readiness. I am going to extend this one more step and say, 
and again i'll refer to mark's book where he describes how he first experienced the perception of the subtle sight in the physical eyes and suddenly it was middle of the night he describes how he saw everything with the full rich beauty of all the colors of the trees and the landscape and so on in the subtle sight all of us have this subtle sight latent to awaken it two steps if you follow the example which uh, of muni that navja indicates first you would infuse in the eyes a greater consciousness in the perception of sight itself look at what happens normally to us we look ya yeah, da okay i hear ya yeah, da okay but what does the musician do listen intently i watch narad listening to an orchestral piece it's a recording he's listening to a cd and he's paying attention to the fine distinction between all the instruments he is paying attention to the movement of how each instrument sound slides against another and builds this attention fused focused through the hearing is infusing consciousness in the ears and the hearing and the power of hearing you keep doing that you will not lose your hearing the rest of your life or the same with the eyes the artist gazing through the physical sight but putting consciousness in it first step second part which is very interesting now putting consciousness but which consciousness which is the perception my mind awareness or as i deepen into a inner or higher state and then gaze out so if you have already mentalized the organ into that something deeper opening within you would activate or trigger the equivalent perception through the sight through the hearing touch whatever it is so you see the uh, process of spiritual growth and particularly its relation to the biology is involved here mentalize your body consciousness and then as your mind opens to inner and higher ranges those inner and higher ranges now can be received in the body and awaken in the body those perceptions or can make the body a vehicle for an expression of those gradations and if you now focus with this in your perception you begin perhaps to see from a subliminal it doesn't have to be higher intuition it can just be the subliminal sight using the physical vehicle as a support and now you see the beauty of the inner ranges of colors sights and you see the flow of energies lights and so on you have a slight opening to the intuition and as you gaze it's as if you're touching and experiencing in contact that flow of colors and those experiences so depending on the grade of consciousness depth and height of consciousness through which you look with a sufficiently mentalized base that's your key to perceiving deeper and higher now not everybody may see in physical form sometimes we perceive on a deeper layer without seeing it in form i don't see auras for example but i sense the vibe the quality and that sense corresponds to the grade at which i am so when i look back there was a stage when i used to live in this grade of consciousness i could perceive that when i shifted and grew a little bit i could perceive that depth and so on but then from that to open to the perception itself uh, just seeing is not enough it's the grade through which you see which makes all the difference even in the subtle sight so i'm linking all this to our discussion of uh, in the yoga and particularly in the context of the integral yoga and buzz asks another technique is the habit of asking oneself during waking hours am i dreaming check for abnormalities in the surroundings and this works for me to become lucid yes this is the commonest method to become lucid in dream you make it a habit in the daytime to just check oh look at your hands am i dreaming how many fingers do i have is something different just keep doing that multiple times in the day and suddenly at night you'll end up doing the same thing you look at your hands and say oh something is wrong i'm feeling seeing six fingers oh now it's four fingers oh and you suddenly become conscious i'm dreaming that's all so there are ways there are methods like this for lucidity in the dream uh, what mark shared was through lucid dreaming to become conscious out of body is more difficult than the method which he recommends which is to wake up uh, in the middle of the night but we'll discuss the methods next time 
but yes this is valid and last question we will end with to tun long back i saw a dream where i was told that india would be politically led by a man who is a devotee of shri aurobindo and he would bring the true changes interesting yes so some dreams can be uh, prophetic sometimes they can indicate imminent events but always remember whatever you may see in the dream positive or negative represents a possibility what you do what you are how you act the state of consciousness from which you act will determine which way things go finally if you've seen a negative thing you can change circumstances if you've seen a positive thing you could still miss the opportunity because you did not make the necessary effort you did not live up to your requirement so never take these things fatalistically see them as indications and rather work on yourself make the necessary efforts and that's how we will be able to incarnate manifest and divinize our consciousness and the life which we live so i think today we have only covered questions we have not gone deeper into the themes but i would like to take it slow i want to make a thorough uh, exploration of this and also especially the out of body experience also as we go along but do look back some of you might want to review what we have discussed but look back at also the exercises for becoming conscious in sleep or recalling dreams on waking up both and the two are connected to the extent you feel uh, interested make the effort it is completely worth it i can say this from experience and all of this will be helpful in the sadhana irrespective of the particular line of sadhana that you follow but especially in the context of the integral yoga where we want to develop uh, all the levels of consciousness and develop full awareness of our whole being as well as of the reality of the cosmos we'll take a moment now to concentrate in aspiration on whatever we choose to do in our effort to develop our possibilities Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Just as a quick uh, indication, next Saturday we will not have the usual session, but rather I will upload a prior recording of the series on of talks on the supramental manifestation. But at this time. it will be like the inauguration of that series because i will not be available for this discussion but we'll continue this discussion the saturday after next